Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event, uh, which is titled Hippocampal Neural Circuits in Awake Head Fix Mice Navigating a Real World Environment. Uh, today, we're fortunate to be joined by Professor Simon Schultz, uh, Professor of Neurotechnology and Head of the Neural Coding and Neurodegenerative Disease Lab at Imperial College London, and Professor Michael Gord, Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Molecular, Cellular, and Developmental Biology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, today, they're going to be discussing their research using two-photon microscopy to study the neural circuits of the hippocampus in uh, awake head-fixed mice navigating a real-world environment. Okay, now without any further ado, I'm very pleased to introduce our first speaker, Professor Simon Schultz. Uh, Simon, thanks so much for joining us today, and feel free to take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, so um, today I'm going to tell you about some recent work that we've been uh, we've been, been doing, uh, looking at play cells in head fixed mice navigating a floating real world environment. So, um, so this work has uh, been done at Imperial College London. Um, you can see my the, the lab that it's been uh, been done in is sort of somewhere back in there, um, sort of behind. Um, the, the sort of front uh, entrance of uh, the Royal School of Mines building in London. Now, um, our motivation in coming to this work um, was uh, really, uh, it really came out of um, a line of um, research on understanding the neural circuit basis of neurodegenerative disorders. So, um, dementia is um, as I'm sure you're aware, a, a growing problem for the world. Um, um, it's, um, I, you know, dementia sort of results in deterioration of memory, sort of thinking and, and behavior, um, and is affecting a large number of people worldwide. Uh, so around 50 million, million people worldwide have dementia, and of, of these people, Alzheimer's disease accounts for 60 to 70% of these. Now, if we want to make progress on this problem, we really need to understand um, the basic neural circuit mechanisms that underpin you know, the deficits um, um, that you know, give rise to uh, the problems in dementia. Uh, uh, if we can do that, you know, then maybe we can start to use that to sort of steer the development of new treatments. Now, um, in so doing, um, mouse models of various aspects of neurodegenerative disease are extremely important. Um, and I would argue that in order to make best use of these, we really need a technology platform which lets us get at um, both you know, behavioral issues that are stemming from dementia, at um, changes in neural circuit structure and function, but during um, cognitive and memory tasks which, which are affected by dementia. So, um, so this project was really sort of originating from the need to develop a technology platform um, or bring, bring together a technology platform, if you like, um, to get at these kind of questions. So, um, to do so, you know, there are a number of technology approaches we could make use of. Um, and there were really sort of three um, technology games in town at the moment, I think, that, would, that sort of lend themselves to this. Um, one of them is high-density multi-electrode arrays. So, um, uh, most recently um, illustrated by the NeuroPixels array, for instance, which really give us unprecedented sort of levels of um, ability to record from um, large sort of densely packed um, sets of cells um, in um, the brains of behaving animals. Uh, so, the, the one approach, because the trouble is we're just looking at an electrical signal there. We don't actually sort of um, see the cells. Uh, we can't exactly localize where they are and we're sort of restricted in, in finding out further things about them. Nevertheless, it's a powerful approach, which will be very useful. Um, another um, approach which has actually been developed quite a bit recently is um, the miniscope, where you have a head fixed um, uh, microscope, which is attached to the head of a mouse or a rat. And that allows you to do single photon fluorescence imaging, um, where you might have a genetically encodable calcium indicator, um, for instance, in, in 
the mouse brain, and um, you can um, do wide field imaging um, and pull out the activity of, of sort of many, you know, the signals of many hundreds of neurons. Now the trouble is that um, the optical signals you get are not um, uh, um, sort of separated in um, the Z direction in depth, um, so you need to demix those. Uh, and you know we are getting better at doing that, but nevertheless, um, the imaging that you get out is is not as good as two photon imaging. So it's this um, uh, technology on the right, multi photon imaging, we'll be talking about here. And as you can see from the um, uh, from the rotating maximum intensity intensity projection there, from uh, taken from um, the layer five pyramidal cells in the cortex of a mouse brain. Um, it gives you sort of exquisite um, uh, spatial resolution and very good temporal resolution on um, on cells, but of course it requires head fixation, and that has um, a lot of limitations associated with it. So how can we do behavior under head fixation? How can we do interesting behavior under head fixation? And we, we want to do memory tasks, so actually that's um, uh, maybe particularly challenging. So we wanted to image neural activity during a memory task. And here's the general sort of setup um, sort of that we use. Um, so, so over on the top left, you can see uh, basically a sort of schematic of, a, of a, our apparatus with a mouse brain. Um, now, we actually have a, um, a window into the brain. We aspirate a small area of cortex above the hippocampus. So we're, we're particularly interested in looking at the hippocampus. And in particular, we're going to look at our area CA1 of the hippocampus, where you know, wherein you find the, the famous place cells. And uh, so we, we aspirate a small area of um, cortex above it, down to the level of the corpus callosum. We sort of, um, sort of make a, a cranial window there by putting a, a small cover slip in. And you can see we have the objective lens of the microscope effectively sitting directly above, um, um, above the brain of this mouse. Now we have to label the cells in some way as well. Um, and we, um, in this project, we've used GCAMP6, um, um, the genetically encodable calcium indicator. Um, we use GCAMP6S, um, uh, which has got sort of quite, um, uh, quite good sort of signal to noise ratio, um, uh, quite good signal amplitudes obtainable from it. Um, and in what we, we did in this project is we actually used a construct which gave it together with MRuby. Um, so, so we used GCAM6 as a, as a green indicator for calcium, but in the cells where we, we put it in, um, you know, we also um, transfected with MRuby, and MRuby just gave us a sort of a fixed um, sort of static marker of the cells. So you can see in this image, um, the top middle here, um, there's both a sort of an overlaid green and a red channel. You can see sort of red basically um, corresponding to um, Sort of the interior of cells and sort of green around the edges and a few a few cells you'd happen, happen to see just green there. Um, now the reason for using a red marker as well is because we actually want to track these cells over multiple days. So then, um, okay, the nice thing about GCAM 6S compared to earlier um, in earlier um, uh, ca calcium biosensors is the signal amplitude was increased and that's gone on. We now have sort of GCAM 7, etc. But, but they did that basically by reducing the baseline fluorescence. Um, and so that means if you want a sort of a stable signature to track over time, it's not really a, a, a the green channel is not uh, the best one to choose for that because of course, which cells are active at any given point in time is going to change. So it's very useful to have a red um, static marker as well. And so in our case, we've used this MRuby. It could be um, something else. It doesn't have to be delivered together or you could have a separate um, uh, uh, virus to, um, induce um, uh, red fluorescent proteins in some cells. You could also be using that um, to um, label particular cell classes as well, and so kill two birds with one stone in that way. Um, so, so that sort of lets us look at um, the activity of a, um, an area of cells here, and I should say this, this work is being done um, um, has, uh, primarily by um, Dr. Marianne Goh, a postdoctoral fellow, um, you can see a picture on the right here, um, uh, together with um, Jake Rogers, who was a, uh, another postdoc who specialized in the behavioral side, um, and um, um, Katie Davey um, and Siegfried Prado were involved in the analysis work here. Um, so you can see um, over on the, the, the bottom left there, um, 
the um, sort of fla flashes of, sort of calcium from um, populations of cells um, um, in actually three times actual speed. So, so it, you can see the, the sort of the patterns sort of coming up, coming up there as the um, cells are active. Um, now, um, the additional thing we can do with this is um, uh, to co-label um, cells um, that are all sort of co-label um, areas of tissue which are affected by um, amyloid plaques. And we've done that um, using um, methoxy XO4 um, and um, we basically inject that intraperitoneally. Um, we um, can then we move the laser excitation wavelength down to 720 nanometers. And basically the first few days of sort of imaging, we actually spend sort of mapping the mapping the brain, finding out where the cells are, and also seeing where, where the cells are relative to the plaques. The plaques are sort of shown here in this um, in this sort of purple channel. Um, okay, so, so that's what we're looking at. Um, now, how do we do the behavior? So this is the apparatus. Um, so um, we have head fixed mice um, running um, in an air levitated uh, cage. So that's the um, uh, this sort of Neurotar um, mobile home cage you can see down here. There are basically sort of little air jets um, which sort of um, result in this um, carbon fiber cage floating on, on, on a bed of air. The mouse is head fixed and the um, um, the mouse, when the mouse is uh, running, moving, for instance, it's actually the cage that moves rather than the mouse. And this is all um, under the two-photo microscope there. So um, this sort of shows that the apparatus in action. Um, you can see um, um, an example here of a mouse running in a circular track. Um, this is the most common track we use, um, where it's just sort of running around and around in a circle. Um, and um, uh, but you can put sort of various other tracks as, as well. And you can see here another example with a circular track with a stop and a Y maze and, and so forth. And, and we've done the same thing with, with a fully sort of open field environment. Um, so uh, one thing that's important to note um, is that um, in this apparatus, and actually I'll just sort of go back and sort of show the apparatus again. You can see you're seeing this here in the light, but of course normally when we're doing these experiments, it's in, it's in the dark. Now we actually don't uh, intentionally don't illuminate the background, um, and that's because if if there were um, distal background visual cues, um, they would be you know, so the animals fixed in one place, so they wouldn't be moving um, uh, with the animal if you like. Um, so there'd be a confounding stimulus. Um, so we're doing this in the dark, um, and um, but we do have proximal visual cues on the maze itself. And these are actually phosphorescent tapes. So basically at the start of each behavioral session, we effectively charge them up by switching the light on. Um, and then um, they sort of slowly decay um, over, um, over sort of tens of minutes following that. And um, um, these result in, um, in visual cues that the mouse can see, um, the um, scotopic rather than photopic uh, vision, uh, so sort of dark adapted vision. Um, and um, there are also um, tactile cues as well. So the mouse has proximal um, visual and tactile uh, cues with which to recognize where it is in the environment. Um, and mice learn to do this over several weeks. Um, um, uh, you know, actually, sort of t typically a week or so is sufficient in, in in our experiments these days. And um, you can see two examples here. One where the top, where you've got um, basically the mouse running around a circular track and the bottom is an open field environment. And you can see over sort of 14 or so behavioral sessions um, um, of which um, some of those are sort of multiple sessions per day, um, they, learn to, they learn to run. We measure the, basically the performance on this task effectively by what fraction of the um, of the session that they're actually running for. And so they end up um, basically learning to run um, for a, a water reward, um, um, a substantial fraction of the time, which is what we want uh, in order to map place fields and, uh, and uh, basically run our memory task in effect. And similar in the open field environment to the, to the circular track. Now um, we can uh, ask, questions about memory in several ways with this. Um, um, the first of them is that, um, so now over 
the week or so in which we do our behavioral training, they're typically trained, exposed to, to two environments, which we call FAM1 and FAM2, familiar one and familiar two. So these, these environments, they, they know very well. Now, at the start of each um, imaging session, they typically spend 20 minutes in FAM1, which we consider our reference environment. If we then put the animal into FAM2, we basically just sort of uh, switch, switch the cage on the, on the platform there. Um, what you expect to see is place field remapping. Okay, effectively, the, the set of place fields in the hippocampus, um, the, the cell re cells responding to particular locations in place, constitute the spatial memory in effect. Um, when you move it into a different environment, effectively it remembers it's a different, uh, a different uh, spatial environment and the place fields remap um, into a, and we'll see later on uh, how that actually works in practice. But we expect them to sort of remap corresponding to its spatial map of this new environment. So that's m like memory recall, it's spatial memory recall. On the other hand, if it spends 20 minutes in environment FAM1 and then we put in into a novel environment which it's never seen before, um, then that's a sort of like a memory encoding task. It's learning, and we could be imaging you know, during this time, it's sort of learning this new environment, uh, laying down the new spatial memory. And we image at the same time as this. So you can see a typical example here, we've got um, a, a 300 micron sort of uh, square field of view. We typically now do them with 500 micron um, um, square field of view. Um, and you can see the green channel, the red channel. Um, and then um, on the right here, um, there is basically the, um, the ROIs, um, regions of interest, uh, corresponding to a relatively large number of cells that we've extracted. Um, in this case, using the, the Kaiman um, uh, platform. So we have our, effectively, we have our own, own platform, but it uses, um, sorry, our own um, pipeline, which uses um, as part of it um, the, the Kaiman uh, um, pipeline for extracting individual cells. Now, having done that, we can then pull out the calcium um, time series corresponding to each of these cells. So just to explain what you're looking at here, so. The first um, row here, um, shown in magenta, is um, actually the spatial position of the mouse. Um, so the, the circumference of this um, circular environment is 100 centimeters, and it's basically running from one, um, you know, running continuously around it, and you can see its position sort of advancing through there. Now, as we're doing that, we, we um, can basically extract the time series from many cells. We're just showing a, a, a small subset of them here. And we've got a continuous time series there. We then extract um, events and um, we keep both the time and the amplitude of each of these calcium transient events. And that's what you're seeing down below here, um, plotted with the, so there's a, there's a dot for every event and the radius of the dot um, corresponds to the amplitude of the event. So we can, so it's sort of like a spike train, if you like, but, it, but there's a bit more information because we're keeping the amplitude of, of each of these events. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind that these calcium transients may correspond to multiple action potentials. We're, we're not trying to sort of resolve um, the action potential time series in um, you know, as a spike train per se. Um, we think that's too hard for cells that you don't have a, um, um, you know, a simultaneous um, recording from in order to sort of calibrate the, the calcium to, to spiking uh, uh, relationship. Um, but we can basically keep this as a sort of measure of activity. Um, okay. And what do we see? <coughs> so um, in the um, circular track, um, you can see here there's sort of five examples, very typical um, place cells here, each of which fires basically when the animal is in a particular location around the track. Um, and you can see the, these examples are, are sort of fairly um, um, reliable. They, they tend not to fire anywhere else. They tend only to fire in this one part of the track. Um, we can, um, for each lap um, around the track, we can we can uh, sort of um, bring that out into a matrix where we've got position along the track on the x-axis, the lap number on the y-axis, and we can get a sort of a raster-like um, thing here. And you can see here, there's a sort of fairly systematic um, relationship, um, you know, the, the cells are, are really responding at particular locations um, sort of systematically there. So we have place tuning. Okay. Um, 
we can we can average across all of those laps um, and then order um, the cells by the location um, their preferred their preferred location for firing and that's what you can see on this uh, plot over on the left here um, pulling all of those together um, we have we can sort of you know pull all of the cells in fact across multiple animals and we, we'll see um, uh, something like this next plot here which sort of really shows this sort of nice diagonal line corresponding to a um, um, a fairly uniform sort of distribution of, um, of tuning preferences. If you actually look into that a little bit more deeply, the next um, figure along here, um, and you look at where these place field preferences are, there is actually a little bit more information there. So the cues, um, the visuotactile cues tend to be in particular, well, they're in particular locations on this, um, um, around this circle. And then in addition, there are door, two doors which are used to introduce the mouse sort of into or, or out of the um, the maze. And it seems that um, you have more place fields at those door locations, the entrance and exit locations. Um, the place fields um, tend to be between rather than on top of the queues. Um, and they tend to be in this environment about sort of 20 centimeters or so um, in, in length. Okay. Um, their spatial information content is actually um, quite high. Um, it's um, sort of around uh, you know, one bit per event there, which is sort of comparable to what you see in um, in sort of freely moving or um, tethered um, uh, animals. Now, <coughs> one thing we're interested in looking at was um, comparing the cells like the ones I've just shown you, which had place field tuning to some of the other cells. So obviously there are many cells that we might record which don't have place tuning. Um, and you know, how do these differ? Um, um, the first thing we can do is we can just look at the event rate, like the rate at which these um, calcium transients are occurring, and they seem to occur at a higher rate for place cells than for non-place cells. Um, we can actually um, do a slightly more nuanced analysis where we, over a particular time, um, you know, window of time, we can add up the amplitudes of these events and then divide by the time window. And then we've got a sort of an activity measure in delta F on F per second. And that too um, you know, shows that same, um, same trend that the place cells tend to be more active than the non-place cells. Um, it's not particularly surprising. Um, now, what about the variability? That was something we're interested in getting at. Um, so um, each time the animal goes around um, the, um, the track, and you can see over on the top left, a little sort of circle with a little box there. Um, so each, each time the animal is passing through a particular location, um, we can sort of add its activity to a list, if you like, and then um, we increase that list as, as we accumulate more and more um, um, passes through that box. And then we can look at the, the mean of that activity over, over the passes through the box and the variance of it. Now, um, generally with um, neural activity, you expect that the variance increases with the mean. In a Poisson process, the variance will increase proportionally to the mean, um, but in general, it's going to be proportional to the mean to some kind of power. And that power, um, beta here, um, we can think of as sort of as a variability exponent. Um, now, um, this, this is an analysis that's been done more commonly in visual neuroscience literature, and we sort of brought it into the place field literature here. Um, so you can take um, two examples, for instance, and you know, um, plot the, um, the variance against the mean for different locations of that box. So you can change the mean by moving that, that box around the circle. Some areas um, got, like in the place field, a higher firing rate, et cetera. Um, and you know, that gives you sort of many points. You can fit a line to that, and then the slope of that gives you that variability exponent. So there are two examples shown there. And then on the right, we can, we're sort of showing the entire population here. And the interesting thing you see there is that actually the, um, the place cells have a lower variability exponent. So they're actually more reliable um, for, for the same, um, you know, for a given firing rate, they, they fire more reliably um, than the non-place cells. And uh, we just sort of note this um, because we really think this might be an important signature of circuit changes in, in dementia. Um, there's a major hypothesis there, the aberrant excitability hypothesis, that, um, that this might be a, an interesting uh, um, way to look at that, um, or, or other changes, of course. Um, okay, now that was this sort of circular track. Um, what about the open field? Um, so um, 
Um, the short answer is we see um, good place fields in the open field too. Um, uh, so we can see um, four examples there. Um, one thing to note, and you can see that we're sort of showing this on day one and day three there, they tend not to be um, stable over long periods across many days. Um, and um, you know, this um, you know, may be something that's slightly different in this um, um, sort, of, um, uh, sort of floating environment, where remember, we've got the animal's head fixed, so the vestibular information um, is not as you would expect in a normal animal, and maybe that's something that sort of helps stabilize these over, over longer periods of time. Um, but again, um, the, the information rates are actually quite high and um, are comparable to uh, what we see in sort of freely moving animals. Um, these place cells um, um, remap across environments. So if you take um, the animal from um, one environment into another, as I said, we expect to see place field remapping. And so we can see that if you look at this um, uh, figure on the lower left there, um, you have um, um, basically the, the set of place fields sorted according to one environment. If you um, then put the animal in environment B and use that same sorting, it just looks random because there's, um, <clears throat> you know, there is maybe some tuning in that other environment, but it's um, um, the, the sorting from the, but basically that because they've remapped, you can't then see this nice straight line anymore. If instead you sort those same cells on the basis of their place field in environment B, you can see the, the image like on the right and you know, you, you suddenly see this nice um, diagonal line again. So, so we have remapping a, across environments. Where, where do the cells remap to? Um, basically, the short answer is anywhere. It, it, it doesn't seem to make any difference. It's, uh, um, uh, you know, where a place cell had its um, preference in one environment, you put it into the other environment around this circular track and it just uh, seems to sort of randomly locate. Um, so, okay, that was um, remapping across two different environments. But what about if you take um, the animal from one environment on one day and then you go and put it back on the following day into the same environment? And so we're looking sort of over longer periods of time. And um, the place fields do shift dynamically over time. You can see some examples on, um, um, say, cell 143 on the, the left there, which actually is relatively sort of stable. You can see the next one down, though, seems to be shifting between sort of days three and four there. It seems to be shifting its place field. Um, the one below that uh, seems to have sort of shifted and then moved back maybe. Um, and the one below that just sort of shifted completely. So, so there is um, a sort of substantial sort of um, shift over time, even in the one, one D environment. And um, um, again, this, um, you know, if you look at sort of neighboring days, they're reasonably close, but then the, the shift is sort of becoming further and further. And, um, you know, over sort of three or four days, you have a substantial shift in, in the place field. Now, in, um, in freely moving mice, um, at, at least from one major study on that, um, there seems to be more, um, a, a longer duration uh, stability over time. Uh, however, in virtual reality environments, it's actually very similar to what we see here. So, uh, so it could be this is a, a, a feature of the head fixation, um, um, uh, or it could be something else. Now, finally, um, what we were able to do was to, to look at not just single cell properties, but um, the properties of um, the entire ensemble of cells. And the way we do that here is we, we, we um, so you take the data, we put it into a matrix of cells by time, okay? Um, and at each, we can say take two points in time. We, at each point in time, we can you know, we extract a vector, which is basically the pattern of activity um, um, over all of the cells. And we can compare that pattern of activity with the pattern of activity at a different point in time. Now, um, so those are vectors, so we can have the angle between them. And the cause of that angle is what we think of as the cosine distance. So we then make this um, time by time matrix where each element in the matrix is basically the cosine distance between the patterns you see at those points in time. And having done that, you can then do dimensionality reduction on, on that matrix. Um, and we do that with multi-dimensional scaling. But as you sort of see, it works on, with a number of different methods. And you can look, we're looking at an example in three dimensions there. And we can study how that works as a function of how many um, dimensions we include there. And you know, we find that you know, um, as you sort of increase the dimensions, you can explain more and more of the variance. And, and we found that 
you know, compared to at least sort of, you know, two other methods, principal components and analysis and Laplace and eigenmaps, the, the MDS method we were using um, in variant, in the variance explained measure was, um, was slightly better. Now, how, what does this look like um, for our circular track? Um, and um, we can see that in three dimensions there. We can easily just look at this um, sort of two-dimensional version on the top right. And you can see that um, uh, in, in um, two or three dimensions, um, you're really capturing the structure of, of the environment that the mouse is exploring. So, so you can see that sort of the color code really shows like as the mouse is going around, uh, around the environment, you know, the, the pattern of activity in the brain is sort of systematically changing to reflect that. Um, slightly more complicated in the open field environment, but in, in part because we've got two variables here. Um, instead of just sort of one environment, the angle um, around the track, we've got the angular position and the radial position. And um, the angular position seems to be um, a little more sort of salt and pepper, sort of less structured there. There is some structure there for the radial position. Um, and we can basically just sort of color code those separately and sort of look at the structure of the representations there. Um, uh, if we if we compare these, the circular track and the open field, um, we can look at the amount of variance explained um, as a function of the number of dimensions of the manifold we're looking at. And, and then um, we can sort of count up how many of these dimensions or eigenvalues do we need to capture 90% of the variance. We can call that the dimensionality of the, of the manifold. Um, and then looking across on the, the middle plot here, you can, you know, you can study that dimensionality um, against the number of cells that we're, that we're including in our analysis. And you can see um, the dimensionality of the open field is sort of um, systematically much higher. Um, uh, so the open field representation is systematically much higher than the representation of the, um, the circular track. Um, now we can actually then to sort of look at that by trying to decode um, the, um, the um, uh, variables, in this case, we're decode, decoding the angular position, and you know, maybe unsurprisingly, we were able to do that much better for the, for the circular track. Um, okay, I'm going to skip that one just to say that it doesn't really matter much what um, method you use, um, what manifold learning method you use. But the final thing I'd like to talk about is just sort of a brief taster that you can, of course, you know, use other tasks with this as well. Um, and uh, the one thing that we've done is to um, uh, look at a, a sort of a simple spatial working memory task um, um, called forced alternation. So um, the mice um, sort of run around, um, I, I've, we've called it a Y maze, but really it's a sort of a theta maze here. They, they go one way on one, on one path and then the next time they have to remember that they went that way and then go the other way instead. So they learn this um, very well over, over several weeks as well. So um, we're now able to sort of use uh, use this um, environment to, uh, to ask questions about different memory tasks as well, um, like spatial working memory tasks. So finally, um, I'd like to finish by sort of summarizing. We've, um, we've used the, um, the floating cage system um, uh, to map um, place cells in 1D and 2D, and we've sort of really validated the system as a method for doing that. Um, we've um, been able to image calcium signals in populations of neurons during cognitive tasks. We've applied that to spatial memory, to the circular linear track and the open field task. Um, we've shown that working memory tasks are also possible with this platform. Uh, we're able to observe the recall of old and the formation of new spatial memories, and we're able to track the same neurons over several weeks. Um, we find high spatial information content, um, which is relatively similar to um, in range to that you find in um, freely moving mice or tethered mice. Um, uh, the one uh, thing we would note is that the remapping of the representation of the same environment on different days uh, seems surprisingly fast. I mean, you expect this to occur, but it, it occurred uh, over a slightly faster time scale than we had predicted. So thank you for your attention. Um, I would just sort of finally like to um, end by acknowledging um, some of the people involved, um, in particular, um, uh, Mary Ann Go, um, a postdoctoral fellow who led on this work, um, Dr. Yu Liu, um, the lab manager in the group who helped um, with the work as well, Siegfried Prado who helped with some of the analysis work, um, Jake Rogers who helped a lot with the behavioral work, and then finally on the spatial um, working memory task, um, Yimei Li and um, Gina Song uh, who were um, involved in sort of getting that uh, working memory task uh, up and running. So thank you for your attention.
Excellent. Thanks so much, Simon, for the fantastic presentation. Uh, and now I'm very pleased to introduce our next presenter, uh, Professor Michael Gord. Um, Michael, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. All right. So thank you, Liam. And uh, thank you to NeuroTAR and to Insight Scientific for hosting the webinar. So today I'm going to tell you about some recent work from our lab. This is all unpublished on cellular resolution imaging of the transverse hippocampal plane in behaving mice. So now those of you who uh, know me or my work at all may be wondering who let this uh, visual cortex guy into a talk about the hippocampus. And that's a very reasonable question. And uh, the, the reason kind of how we found ourselves here somewhat by accident is that we've become very interested in what mouse vision really accomplishes for the animal. So uh, when we talk about uh, primates, including humans, uh, we use our vision for you know, recognizing that conspecific across the street or seeing that ripe piece of fruit hanging from a tree. And uh, mice tend to use their nose for such functions. And so uh, that led us to start asking, what do they use vision for? They still have a considerable portion of their brain dedicated to visual processing. And one thing that the nose doesn't really do for the mice is allow them to understand their spatial environment. You know, if you want to know where some obstacles or boundaries are, or, you know, where a potential predator or, or prey is located, uh, their uh, vision is very helpful. And so we've become really interested in this idea that the mouse visual system uh, gives kind of process inputs to uh, uh, parts of the brain that are involved in spatial navigation. Um, so this could be useful for determining place cells, uh, for example, in the hippocampus, for uh, head direction, for kind of aligning our orientation relative to the environment in uh, the retrosplenial cortex and other areas, as well as uh, our understanding of where boundaries are in the environment. So this is an egocentric uh, border uh, cell uh, at the bottom here, which were recently discovered, uh, where, where we kind of know where uh, obstacles are relative to us. And uh, all of these are, are going to rely uh, heavily on visual input. So this is how we became kind of interested in this topic. And then we ended up finding ourselves kind of curious about uh, recording from some subcortical activity. And we realized that some of the uh, applications that we developed for recording cortical activity might actually be helpful in this way. So uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this. And this is you know very new work from the lab. So it's still a little bit raw, but I, th I think you, uh, some of you might find this interesting for your own research. So um, I'll just go through this briefly uh, since Simon already talked about it. But there are some uh, common approaches to measuring hippocampal activity. I'm sure you know about all of them already, such as uh, the tetros, where you have a micro drive uh, cemented to the skull. And then you can independently uh, raise or lower bundles of micro wires to record uh, uh, spike level resolution neural activity. This is really nice if you really want to know exactly when the spike times are happening. Um, it also allows you to record from freely moving mice. Uh, but there are some disadvantages as well, such as you know it can be difficult uh, to spatially localize which cells you're recording from. You can't really use uh, genetic identifying markers as well. Um, and some of these are ameliorated by uh, uh, two photon imaging approaches. Uh, uh, such as shown on the right here. So here uh, you, you actually remove some of the cortex and place a window on the uh, hippocampus. And the advantage here is you get much higher spatial resolution. You can label cells with fluorescent markers. You can image the same cells over time. You can even do subcellular imaging. The disadvantage, of course, is that um, the mice need to be head fixed. You have much poorer temporal resolution. And uh, there's some damage caused just by the prep. So. Uh, you know, again, both of these are, are very useful and we've learned a lot uh, by doing these types of recordings. Uh, now we decided to develop a, a different sort of uh, recording modality using two photon imaging. So it has some of the same disadvantages as uh, the traditional two photon imaging from the top. But what we wanted to do is something that neither of these approaches really get at, which is being able to image the entire uh, transverse hippocampal circuit. And so it's been known uh, for many years uh, that the hippocampus has this really uh, a beautifully extrapolated circuit. So uh, this drawing was done by Santiago Ramon y Cajal. I'm guessing many of you have seen it before um, over a century ago. And just using the Golgi stain, he was able to infer the connectivity uh, within the circuit, you know, such as the input arriving in the dentate gyrus and being sent to the CA3 and then to the CA1 and eventually out of the uh, hippocampus to the cortex. There's some other pathways as well, but it's kind of the primary one. 
and uh, there's, you know, we think that this uh, there's a lot of action happening uh, within this circuit because a stereotype is repeated all down the elongated hippocampal structure. So we really wanted to be able to try to image this circuit and ideally the whole thing simultaneously uh, using uh, light microscopy. And so this is a project uh, that has been uh, uh, fronted by uh, Will Redman and Nora Wolcott, two graduate students in the lab. Um, and I've, I've actually also been involved in some of the uh, surgical approaches. So it's been a fun project for me as well. And the idea here is that we wanted to use microprisms to be able to see down uh, deep into the hippocampal structure. So for those of you not familiar with this approach, it, it's been uh, used in the past for imaging from cortex and other structures. And the idea is that you have this uh, glass prism which passes the light, and then you have a reflective uh, surface at a 45 degree angle along the bottom. Uh, in this case, it's coated with aluminum, um, which reflects the imaging plane 90 degrees. So rather than imaging uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, in parallel with the surface of the cortex, you are uh, imaging in the transverse direction. And what this allows us to do is, uh, so first, let me give you an example of uh, how we can use this in uh, visual cortex. So this is recording from the lab. And here you can actually see all the different layers of the cortex. So this is layer five down at the bottom, and you can see the layer two, three pyramidal cells up at the top. And then uh, in the middle, if you look closely, you can see uh, some of the smaller stellate cells uh, blinking in layer four. And uh, so we can use this in cortex, and uh, this was originally developed by uh, Michael Levine's lab. But what we wanted to do is see if we could actually extend this down to the hippocampus. And so the idea here is that we're using kind of a longer prism, um, and we're, it includes kind of, uh, essentially you can think of it as the tube on a periscope that allows us to get all the way down through the cortex into the hippocampus and then reflect uh, the imaging plane 90 degrees so that we get that nice transverse cross section through the hippocampus. And uh, so the idea here, uh, so taking a sagittal section, uh, this is from the uh, Paxinos and Franklin uh, mouse brain atlas, you end up seeing a, a, a cross section through the dorsal medial uh, tip of the hippocampus. Um, and it's about 1.5 millimeters on the side. And so it's shown here with the uh, red square on the bottom figure. We do have a smaller prism design. So if you're only interested in, in looking at V1, you don't need to see I'm sorry, if you're only interested in seeing uh, CA1 and you're not interested in seeing the rest of the hippocampus, you can use that smaller prism and, and it uses, uh, it causes less damage. It's a little easier to do the surgery. Okay, so uh, let me cut right here to uh, kind of the pretty pictures right away. So this is actually taken uh, using this uh, prism imaging approach from an awake, uh, you know, behaving mouse. And uh, this is a thigh one GFPM mouse. Some of you may be familiar with this line. It was uh, one of the first lines used uh, for uh, subcellular imaging uh, in, in the early days of two photon imaging. And uh, what you can see is it sparsely expresses GFP in a subset of the excitatory neurons. Now, for some reason, the dentate gyrus is actually a much more dense expression. In the CA1 and CA3, you can see this is the cell body layer uh, going along the top and around the left side. And there's just a, a small number of neurons. And when you zoom in, you, uh, as you can see on the right, you can see the elaborated dendritic structure of those neurons. And then the dentate gyrus, as I mentioned, is, is uh, much more densely expressing the uh, indicator. So uh, this just shows that the technique works. Um, and, uh, you know, again, this is an intact mouse. They, they don't know we can, you know, image their hippocampus while we're, uh, you know, while they're uh, running around, for example. And uh, so they, they do need to be head fixed, but they can, uh, as I'll show you later, they can be running around on a moving platform. And uh, so, you know, you may be wondering, probably the first question that came up to us is, is you know, how much damage are we doing? And the answer is we are doing some damage, but it, it's not, uh, totally extensive. So uh, what I'm showing here is some histology we did where uh, we looked at the lesion site and then stain for uh, GFAP, a, a marker of astrocytes. We've also looked at microglia and some other markers to look for uh, potential cellular damage. And uh, there is slightly higher expression of GFAP and, and microglia right on the surface of the prism, uh, but it, it kind of goes uh, back down to kind of basal levels very quickly as, as you go away from the prism. It doesn't seem like we are causing kind of massive damage throughout the whole hemisphere. It's more uh, localized to just in front of the prism face. Um, I should note here that the uh, lesion site you see here is much bigger than it actually is. It's because, you know, when you do the histology, the tissue kind of shrinks away from the lesion site a bit. Uh, as kind of further confirmation, we just wanted to make sure we can continue to image kind of the same uh, structures over time. And so these are actually two images taken over 100 days apart uh, from the CA3 of the hippocampus. 
Um, uh, this is using a different transgenic line for GCAMP, which I'll talk about later. And you can see the same cells uh, are replicated um, you know, over 100 days apart. You can even see some of the same blood vessels. Um, so uh, you know, there's a tiny bit of change, but uh, you can see that uh, the structures are not you know, uh, changing massively. We're not getting massive reorganization or anything like that. So uh, this made us hopeful that you know, we can actually do some uh, kind of quality science uh, using this approach. Now, next, we wanted to characterize and make sure we're not losing a lot of resolution with this approach. The whole advantage of two-photon imaging is that you get really nice uh, subcellular resolution. And uh, so we image these fluorescent microspheres. They're uh, smaller than a micron. So um, the idea is that we can use these in order to see you know, how big it, it appears on our image when, when we uh, use our two-photon imaging. So first we did it just as kind of a, a control. We, we uh, imaged these microspheres through a standard cranial window, and then we did the same thing through the hippocampal microprism. And what you can see is that the, uh, so this is the XY profile of the B, and you can see it's pretty focused at that particular spot. And when we look at uh, the profile on a linear axis, what we see is that the diameter of this uh, submicron bead appears about one micron. Uh, on our image, which is pretty good. It's actually close to the diffraction limit uh, of light. So this is about as, as good as, as we could expect given the numerical aperture of the objective we're using, the wavelength, et cetera. And uh, we get similar values um, when we do it through the prism. So you can see it's a little blurrier here, but when we look at the diameter of, of our apparent bead, it goes from one micron to 1.2. So we're not complaining too much about that. Um, it's a little worse in the axial direction. So this is uh, you know, going through the cranial window would be in the Z uh, plane. Going through the prism is actually uh, in the Z plane away from the prism. Um, here we see a little uh, more spread. So it's about four microns uh, through the cranial window. And it goes up to about seven or eight microns through the prism. So we do have slightly worse resolution through the prism, uh, particularly in the axial direction. However, this is not terrible. I mean, this is still less than the diameter of the cell body. So uh, we don't think it, it's going to cause major issues with our two photon imaging. All right, so, uh, uh, you know, if this is true, then we should actually be able to image subcellular structures in the hippocampus. So next we tried to do that. And here, uh, what I'm showing you is a zoom in on some CA1 neurons, and we've kind of zoomed in on a particular dendrite. Maybe a little hard to see, but if you squint, you can actually see uh, some of the spines dotting the dendrite. Uh, they, they are a little bit harder to resolve than when we image spines in cortex, uh, but uh, using some uh, image processing, we're able to pick them out and we can actually see the same spines across sessions. So we know that we're not, uh, you know, we're not just kind of over filtering noise or anything like that. We've, we've done some other checks too, uh, using uh, uh, the high resolution images from cortex. And uh, we're able to uh, kind of recover the uh, structure of the spines over time. Um, and we can even uh, differentiate them into different spine classes. So these are kind of the averages of the different spines we're able to differentiate, um, including the philopodium, uh, the mushroom spines, the stubby spines, and the thin spines. So for these, what we did is we basically took all of the ones that were identified a certain way and averaged them together. So you can see the profile here. And they were uh, discriminated using you know, various aspects of their um, of their size and, and, you know, ratios of their head to neck uh, uh, diameter and so on. Um, and uh, what, you know, this allowed us to do is actually track the same uh, dendrite over time to see, you know, new spines being added, spines going away. And so we see fairly typical distributions of spines. So we see very few philopodia, uh, which is typical in adult uh, animals. And then uh, the rest are kind of divided between thin, stubby, and mushroom spines. And in terms of stability, the philopodia are the most uh, unstable. They turn over quite quickly, as has been shown before, while our mushroom spines are the most stable. So all of this is, is kind of in accord with what we expected to see. So can we actually do uh, functional imaging uh, with our uh, microprism approach? So here, what we're going to do is actually use uh, genetically encoded calcium indicators. So these are uh, mice that express uh, GCAMP6S in excitatory neurons. We're using a glutamatergic transporter to drive expression. And uh, we're zooming in here on CA1, and you can see a number of these uh, CA1 neurons uh, uh, kind of blinking. This is actually just during uh, spontaneous activity, but you can see quite a bit of activity, and sometimes you can actually see uh, the, the dendrites kind of lighting up, uh, presumably from backpropagating action potentials. 
And uh, we can also see activity in the dentate gyrus. So this is uh, looking at kind of uh, both parts of the uh, dentate gyrus, the more dorsal and the more ventral. And, uh, and the activity in dentate gyrus is a bit more sparse, especially during spontaneous activity, uh, but we can resolve uh, uh, you know, bouts of activity in, in these neurons as well. So just to give you kind of a, a you know, better idea of what we're seeing here, I want to do a little bit of a guided tour uh, through the prism as we're imaging. So we're actually going to start in the uh, cortex. Um, so this is a cortex just right in front of the prism, just to show you that the cortical neurons uh, seem to be, uh, you know, behaving normally. And uh, now what you're seeing is actually the edge of the prism towards the bottom of the screen, that kind of sharp line. And now we're going to uh, translate over to the middle of the prism, and then we're going to rapidly go down in the z-plane through the prism until we can start to see the hippocampus. And so now you can see the CA1 and CA3 neurons uh, lighting up. And then we're going to zoom in and look at our specific regions. So we're going to translate over to CA1 first. And so you can see some of the neurons there. This, again, is just spontaneous activity. Later, I'll show you some activity uh, while the mice are moving around. Now we're going to move over to area CA3. And then finally, we're going to translate over to dentate gyrus. In this particular mouse, the dentate gyrus was a little bit out of plane, so we have to uh, change our focal plane a bit. And then we're going to zoom in so we can see those smaller uh, granule cells in the dentate gyrus, and you can see a lot of activity in them as well. So just to kind of give you an idea of uh, what is happening uh, you know, as you kind of uh, pan around within this uh, microprism. Yeah, one thing I forgot to mention is the way we actually implant it is we take a diamond microblade and use a manipulator to lower it going through the uh, dura and through the cortex into the hippocampus, and then uh, slowly lower the implant again using a manipulator into that incision. And so what that does is it, it kind of pushes the tissue out. And so uh, the cortex kind of around the incision site, it all seems to do just fine. We can you know, find activity in those neurons uh, even you know months after the implantation. We are cutting connections, of course, um, so it's not like we're not doing any perturbation, but there's uh, less damage than, say, if we had to aspirate out the cortex overlying uh, the hippocampus. Okay, so uh, now how do we actually measure spatial responses in these neurons? So here uh, we use the uh, neurotermorbal home cage system, and the idea is that the mice are uh, moving around within this chamber. We can put visual cues along the side. Uh, we actually use uh, this kind of nylon paper, so it's relatively water resistant. And, uh, and so we can have these nice cues that the mice can use to orient themselves. And then uh, we use the tracking system in order to uh, record the location of the mice as they're, as they're moving about. Um, so we can record place fields using this approach. And uh, so we did it uh, for a while in the open field. We had a little bit of trouble because sometimes they wouldn't fully explore the open field environment. They'd you know, stick to the edges or kind of hang out in one area, not another. Um, and so we uh, actually, uh, from advice from a, a postdoc in, in Simon's lab, uh, we decided to move to a circular track where we found that they uh, repeatedly, you know, as, as they circle around, they, they kind of repeatedly sampled the environment. And as a result, we were able to get kind of more robust uh, place cell activity. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna show you from here on out. So first I wanted to just kind of quick you, quickly give you an overview of some of the spatial activity we saw in each of uh, the three major subregions, CA1, CA3, and dentate gyrus. So first in CA1, uh, here we have a uh, kind of typical field. This is a maximum intensity projection. So you can see there's you know, quite a few neurons and even the dendrites. And we found that we can actually measure place fields even in the dendrites, which is kind of cool. And then uh, these are a uh, number of example place fields. So you can see they're nice. They, they respond to uh, particular positions in the track. That bottom one, left one, I, I should point out that the track, because it wraps around, that's not like a bimodal field. It's a, a single field. It's just uh, kind of wrapping around from 80 back to zero. Uh, we also saw a number of cells that were modulated by the speed of the mouse. Um, oh, and the other thing I want to mention about the place fields is that they span the track. So uh, you can see that they span pretty evenly if you look across the number of the cells that we recorded. And uh, yeah, we also found cells that are modulated by the uh, mouse's speed. Um, so these were modulated kind of monotonically. So some increased their activity with speed and some decreased. And then kind of summarizing the results, uh, we found that uh, about 20% of the neurons in CA1 had a uh, nice significant place field activity. 5% uh, or so had uh, significantly modulated speed uh, responses. 
uh, there was just a small percentage, one percent or so, that were modulated by both, and then uh, roughly seventy-four percent uh, were not uh, responsive to either place or speed. Looking at CA three, we see somewhat similar results. Again, there's our example field. Um, again, um, nice uh, place fields that span the uh, the track. We also see some speed cells in CA three. And uh, looking at the summary, we actually see slightly fewer place fields in CA three, but uh, relatively more uh, speed driven cells. Um, so as a result, again, it's about 25% of the total cells are kind of modulated either by speed or uh, by position um, uh, using this approach. And then finally, we looked at the dentate gyrus. Um, and uh, again, we do see some uh, nice uh, place fields. Uh, we think they were maybe a little bit broader, though th this uh, is, is not statistically significant. Um, we have fewer cells in the dentate gyrus. It's just a bit harder to record from there, and, and they're kind of a little less active. Um, but you can see that they uh, tend to span uh, the circular track, uh, and we also find speed-modulated cells. And here, again, we actually find an even smaller percentage of cells that are uh, uh, significant place cells, um, and then, but you know, still 13% or so, and then uh, a similar number of speed cells as to uh, CA3. So uh, you know that you know so far I've showed you that you know we can do uh, both uh, structural and functional imaging uh, throughout the subregions. So I wanted to you know go through some of the advantages and disadvantages of the approach, and I don't want to kind of oversell the approach. Uh, you know, I'm not advocating that everyone throw away their tetrodes and, and dump their two photon prep in the garbage. Uh, there are some disadvantages of this approach. Um, so the implant. Uh, uh, it does cause some damage to the cortex, probably a little less than the traditional top-down uh, two-photon imaging approaches. But you know, one important thing is that it also causes some damage to the dorsal medial tip of the hippocampus, which is the actual structure we're imaging from. So that needs to be kind of kept in mind as an important caveat. We try to go as medial as possible, so we're, we're cutting into as little bit as possible. Um, however, there might be connections that are severed, um, you know, between uh, that part of the hippocampus we're imaging from and other regions. Uh, another disadvantage is this surgery is non-trivial. It, it definitely requires an experienced surgeon. It took us a while to master it. Um, once you get good at it, you, we have a pretty high success rate at this point, uh, though it's not 100%. Um, but you know, there's certainly kind of a training step involved. Uh, the spatial resolution, as I mentioned, is a little bit lower than imaging through a window, though it's not terrible by any means. And then uh, finally, uh, we do have a lower yield compared to when you're imaging uh, parallel to the cell body layer. So when you're doing the top-down CA1 recordings, because your whole field is filled with cells, you can get many more at a time. Uh, for our recording approach, you have these bands of cells. And there's a lot of cells in those bands. Uh, but we're typically talking you know, between 1 and 200 cells at a time, which is a little bit less uh, than the top-down approach. Um, though I still think that's uh, uh, pretty nice, you know, coming from an electrophysiology background. Okay, so some of the advantages of this approach is it allows you to see all of the subregions. You're not limited to just CA1. And, you know, I know people have tried imaging deeper using other approaches, but it often requires kind of compressing uh, the hippocampus in order to get there. So this really allows us to see all the different regions, and we can even see them simultaneously. So unfortunately, I don't have any videos of this, but recently we made some modifications to our microscope so we can really image the entire hippocampus all at once. And you can see CA1 and CA3 and dentate gyrus and all the neurons, uh, uh, you know, lighting up at, at various points. And so I think this could be really interesting for studies where you're looking at interactions between regions regions as they're doing spatial uh, coding or memory tasks, for example. Another advantage is that uh, we can identify different neural subtypes. So some of this is using the typical approaches, you know, labeling them with a red uh, fluorophore, for example. But we can also see some cell types which might be difficult uh, using uh, traditional imaging approaches. So for example, we can, uh, it would be much easier to differentiate uh, CA2 cells as opposed to CA1 or CA3. Uh, we can zoom in on the mossy cells and the dentate gyrus. So these cell types that are typically kind of hard to find uh, using other approaches are much more readily identifiable. Uh, we can, I, I didn't show any data, but we can do chronic uh, imaging of the neurons across sessions. Uh, we found, uh, as Simon did, that they tend to uh, remap uh, quite quickly. Um, but uh, uh, certainly within sessions, we can look at uh, stable encoding across environments, which is pretty cool. 
And then finally, and I think this is actually one of the biggest advantages of this approach, is that because of the imaging plane, we can see the entire dendritic arbor of the CA1 and CA3 neurons. So you can imagine there's some really cool experiments where if you uh, more sparsely expressed to GCAMP, you could actually zoom in on individual spines or segments of dendrites and see uh, how subcellular uh, place fields contribute to the uh, ultimate place field of, of the neuron you're imaging. Um, so, uh, you know, for people interested in dendritic integration or subcellular imaging, I think there's a lot of cool stuff to be done here. And then finally, I wanted to just leave you with a an example use case of you know how this can be used for uh, you know doing some interesting science that you couldn't do with any of the other approaches. Um, so the one I wanted to do here is a very new direction. So um, I, in the past, I've been interested in neuromodulation. So we're thinking of looking at the effect of neuromodulation on the hippocampus. And then um, it turns out my wife is actually a neuroendocrinologist and she said, why don't you look at uh, the effect of hormones on the hippocampus? Because it's been known for some time uh, that throughout the estrous cycle uh, of, the, of the mice, you actually see uh, differing uh, spine densities. Uh, so this is a, a classic result from Catherine Woley and Bruce McEwen's lab. Uh, in which they looked at CA1 apical dendrites and they found an enrichment of spines during the proestrous stage and a reduction during the estrous stage um, with kind of more intermediate numbers during the other stages. And uh, so the first thing we want to do is just see if we can actually see this in vivo. Can we actually see spines kind of growing and shrinking uh, in female mice as they go through the estrous cycle? And so what we did is we uh, started with our mice and then every 12 hours for eight days, uh, uh, so Nora, who did these experiments, had to do some, you know, fairly heroic experiments where she would uh, take, uh, uh, use vaginal lavage to take uh, samples of the cells in order to do cytology. Um, and then we would use, later use this for identifying what stage of the estrous cycle the mice were in. And then she would also uh, image spines within the CA1 apical dendrites. Oh, I should mention that uh, th this effect that uh, uh, Woolley and, and Mikuin found was located in the apical dendrite specifically. So it, it would be hard to do with some of the other uh, techniques, which might let you get to the basal dendrites on top and nothing else. Uh, so then uh, what Nora did was, was take these images and run them through a machine learning network that she developed for uh, identifying the stage. I won't get into that here, but it, it's uh, kind of a nice way of doing it if any of you are interested. And then uh, lined it up uh, later uh, with uh, images of the spines. So after we had kind of annotated the spines and figured out which ones were added and subtracted, uh, we, we lined them up with the specific estrus stages. And the experiments were all done and all the analysis was done kind of blind to the stage of the mouse to make sure we didn't kind of bias our, our uh, interpretation of the data. But what we found is that sure enough, uh, we saw kind of uh, starting with estrus here in this uh, leftmost uh, picture of the spine. And then we imaged the same spine for eight days. And we found that as they went through the cycle, so here I'm just showing four days as they went from estrus to proestrus, uh, we tended to get net addition of spines. Um, there were some spines that went away as well, but there was kind of a net addition of spines resulting in a higher spine density uh, during the proestrous cycle. So this is shown over two cycles here. And it looks like a subtle effect, but uh, um, if, if you compare proestrous, which is uh, uh, so that kind of second bar and then the uh, sixth bar, uh, you see there's about 10% more spines than average. And if you look at estrus, uh, which is a third in the seventh bars, uh, you'll see there's about 10% less spines than the average. Um, so there's a, kind of a net change of about 15 to 20% uh, just over the 24 hours from proestrus to estrus. And uh, it's hard to imagine that a 20% change in, in spine density is not going to have any functional effects. So what we're really interested in looking at next, uh, so, you know, so we show that the spine density is highest in proestrus and lower, lower in estrus. What we really want to look at next is what functional consequences does this have? Does it affect, you know, place field remapping, uh, you know, any, anything like that? So, uh, um, you know, there's there's kind of an exciting next set of experiments to do. We're also doing much more characterization of, you know, which spines are uh, appearing during proestrus. Are they stable? Do they stick around? Or are those the same ones that disappear during the next cycle? Uh, we're really interested to see what's going on there. So hopefully to serve as kind of a good example of how this approach can be used to do some interesting science. And the, as you can imagine, there's all sorts of other things that I think would be uh, really interesting to look at. You can look at the effect of neuromodulators. Uh, you could look at uh, altered protein expression. So a number of you might be interested in uh, disease models, you know, Alzheimer's models, things like that. Um, I think this approach could be really uh, useful for looking at both uh, structural and functional changes with those models. 
uh, pharmacological agents, et cetera. So uh, um, I think there's uh, some cool science to be done, you know, while keeping in mind uh, the various caveats of this system. All right, so that uh, brings an end to my part of the talk. I wanted to uh, thank you all for listening. I also wanted to give uh, special thanks to my lab and, and uh, for this project, especially Will and uh, Nora who led the project. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, most of my lab is actually focused on other projects looking at how uh, visual input uh, influences retrosplenial spatial responses. And uh, we're using uh, uh, some of these systems for uh, doing that work as well. So if you're interested, get in touch. Um, if you ever want to come visit UCSB, it's, it's not a bad place, so drop a line. And uh, so finally, I'm going to turn it back over to Liam. All right, uh, fantastic. Thanks so much, Michael, for sharing your research with us, with us today. And now we are going to move on to the Q&A session. Uh, and I'm just going to add Professor Gord and Professor Schultz to the audio line here. OK, uh, all set, Simon and Michael? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Um, OK, let's jump right in with a great question for Simon. Uh, how does head fixation affect spatial memory? Okay, I mean, th that's an interesting point, which was um, you know, front, forefront in, in our minds uh, when we started this project. Um, so um, clearly our animals, are, our mice are head fixed, and because they're head fixed, they don't have vestibular information, or more to the point, the sort of vestibular asynchrony. Um, with respect to the information you would expect them to get as you know as an animal is sort of naturally moving around its an environment um so we certainly sort of went into this expecting up front um actually not to see place cells in 2d as a result of that um we knew however that from virtual reality studies that we um should perhaps see place cells in um one dimension um in in sort of um you know, tasks where they're sort of, say, traveling through a, a track, like our circular track task. Um, and, and we did see that. But surprisingly, we also saw them in, in 2D. And, you know, really our thoughts on that were um, that, well, certainly vestibular information is important, but actually maybe it's not the full story. And maybe a lot of the issue um, here is actually, um, um, you know, multimodal information that, you know, we have tactile information, we have um, visual information, um, possibly we have olfactory information, etc. as well. And actually, if the animal is able to integrate this this all in, maybe that overcomes um, the, the lack of vestibular information. So, um, uh, actually, so it does, it does affect it, I think, but not as much as we expected. Um, and we were able to, to map, you know, place cells uh, even in uh, two-dimensional environments, which, uh, you know, indicates that spatial memory is, is there. Perfect. Great answer. Um, Michael, I'll uh, ask you to lead this next question, but do uh, other types of cues, for example, tactile cues on the floor, improve place field measurements? Right, so uh, we might need to ask uh, Simon to come on on this because I think he actually looked at it a bit more than I did. But uh, so we did use tactile cues and we did it less so that the animals could kind of tell where they were uh, within the uh, environment, but more as a way to kind of help them clock how far they had gone. So for example, in the uh, uh, circular uh, uh, maze, I guess you call it, or track, uh, we, we had regular kind of cues just so that um, you know, if they were running fast, they could kind of uh, have some indication of, of uh, how fast they were going from the tactile input. As Simon mentioned, they are missing their vestibular input, so we wanted to kind of give them some extra information. However, we uh, used the same cues, so we didn't try to distinguish uh, location based on the identity of the cue. And I'm not sure how much that would help because, uh, you know, remember they're, they're head fixed in place, so it's not like they can really get down there and whisk and, and and uh, help kind of uh, distinguish different objects. They're, they're really only kind of doing it with their paws. And I'm not sure, uh, you know, without kind of spending some time training them, if they could distinguish little differences in cues uh, just as they're moving about. So, uh, you know, in terms of how much it helps, I, I actually don't have a great sense. Uh, Simon might have some insight on that. Sure, yeah, Simon, do you have anything to add on to that? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, I would just add that, um, I mean, we had both visual and tactile cues um, for similar reason. We just wanted to create the richest local environment possible. But what we didn't do is try and, you know, dissociate those two things. Um, 
And uh, that would actually be a, you know, a very interesting experiment to do. It's probably hard to do it properly because, of course, um, you know, okay, you say so they're not necessarily sort of getting down and whisking, but of course they do have whiskers. And if they go through a narrow corridor, you know, maybe they can feel our um, our visual cue, <laughs> etc. Maybe they can see our tactile cues. Uh, um, are hard to know. So, um, yeah, we don't really know which is the most important there, to be fair. Excellent. Um, next question here. Yeah, how long did it take you to train mice in the airlifted environment? Uh, Michael, maybe you could start with this one. Right. So what we ended up doing, and again, uh, part of this was just kind of getting them used to the setup and making sure they were running enough so we didn't really thoroughly empirically test it. But we ended up uh, first putting them in the chamber. Uh, so we did this over two sessions over two days. And then we put the whole chamber in a larger box so that they could just uh, explore it while they're freely moving. And that just kind of let them learn the local cues and get comfortable in the environment. And then we spent about one week of uh, daily head fixation sessions where they would run around uh, on, on the mobile cage system. And we found that usually the first day they were a little bit scared and wouldn't run around a whole lot. Uh, there was some individual variability between mice. And then over that week, they would creep up a little bit. Uh, typically, they were running at uh, uh, about 20 or 30 percent of the imaging session. Um, I suspect if we kept going even longer, we could we could uh, raise that even a bit more. Um, we've generally found with uh, running wheels and things like that, they, they like to run around. So uh, once you get them really comfortable, uh, they might spend more time on there. But we, we just, uh, yeah, after a week, we, we kind of felt like we were hitting a plateau. So we, we stopped uh, training them at that point. Excellent. And Simon, uh, what was your experience like with the uh, habituation? So, of the uh, yeah, I mean, ab about, I mean, similar, about a week. Um, it depends on the particular sort of environment. It t took a little longer to get them sort of nicely running around the open field than the 1D task. Um, and we did water restrict, okay? So um, our animals were rewarded effectively on the basis of how much they ran around, okay? We wanted to get them exploring as much um, so that we could map place fields well. Um, after a week or so, we were up to 50 to 70% um, of time um, exploring that, or time moving in, in the environment, um, which is as much as you want, really. You don't want them doing it all the time. So that's a Excellent. pretty large difference, uh, and I think that's to do with you know how motivated they are based on the water restriction. Yeah, exactly. Perfect, um, Simon. I'll uh, give you this next question here. Uh, don't you need vi uh, distal visual cues to form place fields? Well, that's kind of the received wisdom in the place field community, but apparently not. Um, I should note that the mouse visual system is actually adapted to see things close up. You know, they don't have particularly high spatial acuity. Um, if you think about it, um, features far away have to be big uh, for them to be able to see them. Features closer up can be a little smaller and they can see them. Um, and, you know, it's worth noting that, you know, in our environment, um, you know, within the two photo microscope cage enclosure, uh, rather we, um, you know, it, it's dark. They can't see any distal cues because you know that would be a confound because of the you know the way the environment is set up, so it is only local cues and and yet um, and yet we find place fields. So so you do um, get place fields uh, from the local cues only, um, and and there are previous papers that support that also. Okay, interesting. Um, and Michael, I'll get you to lead this next question. When imaging through the, the micro prism, is there a significant tissue movement relative to the, the prism? Right, so uh, it's actually not too bad. So you also get some movement, but we actually find there's less movement when we're imaging through the prism compared to when we're imaging uh, through a window, for example. So now I, I have an Im image hippocampus through a window, so I can't really compare, but I know imaging cortex through a window, we see uh, you know, a little bit of movement, both lateral and, and uh, uh, Z movement, we, we try to avoid, but, uh, you know, especially if, when they drink, you get uh, quite a bit of Z movement. Um, and uh, with the prisms, uh, both in cortex and in hippocampus, we do not see a whole lot. And we think it's because there's kind of a second anchoring point that keeps the tissue stable. Uh, so it's actually quite nice for, uh, you know, dendritic imaging. Uh, I imagine if you were doing axonal imaging, it would be nice for that as well. Excellent. Um, 
Next question here for Simon. You, you said that you see slightly faster remapping of place fields compared to in freely moving mice. Uh, and so why do you think that is? We honestly don't know. Um, the um, the same applies to the virtual reality um, papers if if you look at them carefully. So, so somehow there is something about freely moving behavior which sort of stabilizes place fields and therefore presumably sort of you know, stabilizes spatial memory um, on a slightly longer time course um, than than you get with. Um, with head fixed preparations, including virtual reality uh, and including um, um, the mobile home cage uh, uh, type environment, um, you know, floating cages. So um, yeah, um, that's interesting. I think it would be interesting to try and pin that down at a later point. Yeah, definitely. Um, Michael, I'll give you this next question. Do you think this imaging approach could be used uh, during other behavioral tasks? Uh, how do you kind of see that playing out? Sure. So, uh, so you know, with the microprism imaging, we could use it for all the same types of imaging circumstances that we'd use for other imaging approaches. Uh, so, for example, with the mobile cage, uh, there's been some attempt to build these uh, uh, T mazes where you can train the mice to alternate for a reward. You can do all the same virtual reality tasks that people typically do. Uh, so, pretty much any head fix uh, task you could run with this approach. Um, one interesting thing I didn't really talk about during the seminar is, uh, you know, it's well known at this point that there are cells in the hippocampus that encode uh, durations of, of uh, time, the time cells, and uh, that would be a very interesting thing to look at uh, using other sorts of tasks. Definitely, and I think in the interest of time, we'll make this next question the last one, uh, and I'll get both of you to respond to this one, but maybe Simon, I'll get you to uh, answer it first, but why did you choose the, the mobile home cage over other approaches? Like uh, you said, a, a treadmill and VR, and what do you think the advantages or disadvantages are uh, in this case? So, um, I mean, we had actually done um, virtual reality uh, um, tasks before. Uh, we developed a, a platform in my lab previously um, for a closed loop um, a treadmill plus virtual reality system for studying the cerebellum, in fact. Um, but I guess you know, my concern when we were moving to do a project on the hippocampus and on spatial memory was I didn't, I wasn't really convinced that in the virtual reality environments the animals really know what the, you know, what they're seeing in a sense. You know, clearly that you know, if you're looking at say the early visual system, that's going to be fine. Um, um, but you know, we wanted to be able to do more complex things like look at two-dimensional place field environments, et cetera. And I thought our, our chances of getting that working nicely were, you know, were best the more um, sort of permanent, if you like, the information could be. Um, and I, I would uh, really say that's the one advantage of the mobile um, home cage uh, system in that um, it, it, there is a sort of a, a permanence uh, of the um, the environment that the animal is is perceiving. Um, I mean, that, that's a, a plus and, and a drawback as well. Obviously, with the virtual reality environment, you can reprogram it on a, on a rapid basis. And there are some things you can, some questions you can ask with that that you couldn't do in another way. But nevertheless, the, the physical environment, permanent physical environment is, is what the mouse's sensory systems and you know, cognitive systems evolved to deal with. And uh, you know, it's what they're adapted to. So therefore, uh, I think it, it it has particular strength for, for looking at cognitive tasks, in fact. Excellent. And uh, Michael, uh, why did you choose the, the mobile home cage? Right. So I think I'm pretty much echoing Simon. So, you know, we've also done some virtual reality in uh, lab. And, and, you know, what we find is, is I think it's great if you want to be able to control the task. I mean, it, it, you're kind of unlimited in terms of which task designs you can use. You can switch environments, you can warp them around. So it's great for that uh, flexibility. However, I think for studying kind of spatial representations in the hippocampus or other areas, there's something about having a real object. You know, when they run into a wall, you know, they, they bump their nose on it, they can whisk against it. Uh, when, they, when they run into objects, the same thing. So there's kind of more meaning to uh, their local environment. Uh, rather than when they're in VR and they bump into you know a wall, they're they're really just uh, um, you know the visual stimulus is no longer updating. There's no real meaning to it. So I think for uh, kind of promoting spatial coding, uh, the uh, floating cage has some real advantages. 
Now, neither of them, you get the vestibular input. So that's something, you know, I think as a field, we still want to work on and, and try to come up with even more realistic uh, solutions where we can image while uh, we get kind of all the inputs that you're getting as you move around in the world. But uh, it, I think this is a, a step in the right direction. Definitely. The, the research is already so fascinating. I can't wait to see where it goes in the future. Um, and yeah, so thanks so much, Michael and Simon, for sharing your, your work with us today. Uh, it's been a real pleasure having you with us. Thank you, Liam. Thank you. Yeah, and a big thanks also to the, the audience for joining us today. And a big thanks to Neurotar as well for helping to make this event possible. Uh, so thanks again for taking part in this Inside Scientific webinar. And we'll see you again next time. Have a wonderful day, everyone.